So welcome to teens and parents. And I would like to introduce to you um, our esteemed guests this evening, um, both affiliated with This Is My Brave. Um, first, we have Anastasia Vlazova, and I will let each of them do an introduction of themselves. But very briefly, Anastasia has been um, working with us at This Is My Brave since early 2020. And she can let us there, tell you a little bit more about that. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. Haley Sherwood. Haley is a clinical psychologist and she's also a This Is My Brave board member. So Anastasia, how about I pass it over to you? I'm gonna jump out of this picture and do some, some back end <laughs> recon here and see if I can get other folks joining in. But you guys take it over. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and addressing this really important topic. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Anastasia Vlasova. I'm 17 years old, a senior in high school. And like Aaron said, I've been working with This Is My Brave since early this past year. No, this year. Um, so I started this year off as an intern for This Is My Brave. And I recently became the creative director of the teen division. So I'm head of This Is My Brave Teens, the Instagram account, where I post a bunch of mental health resource graphics. And I also showcase not only my mental health story, but also other teens' mental health stories. Um, so if you like, go follow that on Instagram. It's a great account and has a diverse uh, variety of content. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it on to Dr. Sherwood. Thank you, Anastasia. My name is Dr. Haley Sherwood, and I am a clinical psychologist in practice in Herndon, Virginia. And thank you to all um, of you for joining us this evening. And um, I uh, specialize, I've been practicing here um, in Northern Virginia for a little over 20 years, and I specialize in adolescent, adult, and family issues. Uh, I've been a part of uh, This Is My Brave since um, the fall of 2018 when I uh, referred a longtime client to audition for uh, This Is My Brave in Arlington, Virginia. And um, then I you know, had the pleasure of uh, meeting Jennifer Marshall and the rest is history. I've been a part of, of the organization um, since that time. So I'm delighted to be here this evening. and. Um, we would like to actually ask our participants to, um, if you have a pen and paper handy, um, we'll just give you, you know, a few seconds to, to grab something to jot some notes down on. We're gonna have some interactive questions uh, a couple of times this evening. Okay, so right. our first little interactive activity is the following question. What are you missing most during the holidays this year? So go ahead and take a few seconds to jot down one, two, or three things that you're missing most about the holidays. It might be that you're not able to see some family members, perhaps you can hang out with friends, or maybe that you're not gonna be spending as much time outside, unfortunately. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Sherwood and she's gonna get into the whole topic of why the holidays are so difficult this year during COVID. Thank you. So we are all exhausted. We have all been, you know, living the last nine months in, in a way that, you know, none of us ever anticipated. Um, and, you know, we, we are going into, we're, we're actually, we're already into a holiday season um, like never before. And, you know, the holidays are often uh, a challenging time for, um, many folks and particularly um, people that struggle with mental health challenges. And so, you know, we're kind of going in now to the holidays with just this immense sense of loss, right? So, you know, loss of routine, loss of connection, you know, uh, with friends, with coworkers, with teachers, coaches, you know, the uh, ballet teacher, piano teacher, I mean, you name it. Um, there's just, you know, we're sort of all experiencing this, this grief. And, um, you know, perhaps some people have lost loved ones because of COVID or other reasons, um, or have lost jobs. So things look quite different this year uh, for the holidays. And, you know, we're also in a season where there are massive expectations. So, you know, um, to, to, to um, you know, 
have the perfect holiday, the perfect Christmas tree and the perfectly wrapped presents um, and, you know, um, to have the, the perfect meal and, um, you know, so that everything, you know, has the magic of Christmas. And I know, you know, in, in my work, I hear uh, most often from, from moms, but, you know, I, I don't want to shortchange dads by any stretch, um, you know, that, that moms feel a lot of pressure to make the magic of, of the holidays and, and, you um, and so, you know, I, I would also say that, you know, this is a difficult time, you know, pre-pandemic, but also now, you know, that there are people that struggle with um, seasonal affective disorder that is, you know, also known as SAD. Um, the days are shorter, it's colder, um, you know, that, that people feel um, less motivated, they're sleeping more, um, they have, you know, clouded thinking, difficulty concentrating, um, it just, you know, everybody's kind of in, you know, this kind of hibernation mode. So, you know, that's what's, you know, I think we're all sort of collectively experiencing right now. And, and then Anastasia, we want to sort of talk a little bit from a teen's perspective. Yeah, of course. So as Dr. Sherwood said before, obviously we're having, we're lacking uh, the social connection. And I know that for me, I've had an imbalance of social connection because on the one hand, I have so much time to spend with my family, but then on the other hand, I'm pretty much deprived of any social connection with my friends, um, except the occasional outing, but even that is very limited right now for obvious reasons. And on the one hand, spending time with family is amazing because I think that during our schedules prior to COVID, we had very little time to have quality time with our family because we were constantly running around. We all had extremely busy schedules with school and sports and work. Um, but now we actually get to um, take advantage of this time with our family members. However, I don't know about you all, but I have personally found myself in situations where I end up lacking personal space or privacy because I'm constantly in my house surrounding by all of my family members and my sister for example just moved back from college to home because of COVID she was living in the in New York City before so it wasn't the best place to be uh, during the pandemic and so now we've got all of our family members here in one house and especially if you're living in a smaller home it's even more difficult because at least in bigger homes people might have their own rooms but oftentimes people are end up sharing a room with a sibling or something and so they're very limited in spaces that are free and just isolated just for them um, and also it's difficult because we don't see our classmate acquaintances you know the people that we would see in school on a daily basis, but we wouldn't necessarily hang out with outside of school, even though they were a small part of our day, they were still, they still impacted our social life. You know, there were still people that we interacted with and that added to our lives. And now that we don't have any of that, it makes it very difficult to feel connected and to feel supported and to feel as if you're doing anything or matter to anyone, which is really difficult during this time. And also if you are a teen, specifically a senior watching this right now, who is in my position, or if you're a parent of a senior in high school, you know we're going through a college application season right now, which is very stressful most of the time and uh, anxiety inducing for sure. For example, for me, my anxiety has been fluctuating these past few weeks because I'm going through these constant up and ups and downs of which applications do I want to submit, which essays do I need to rewrite and all of this along with assignments for school. And so it academically, it's just a lot to juggle right now. So all of the stress and anxiety and sadness and feelings of loneliness is totally understandable. However, it also needs to be overcome and you also need to learn coping skills to manage your mental health because we can't just let our mental health fall apart completely because obviously poor mental health impacts all of these other aspects aspects of our lives and we want everyone to thrive here and so I want to segue into the conversation of how parents can help teens with their mental health and I'm going to bring that to Dr. Sherwood. Thank you. So you know I think that um, it's really important for parents to be taking good care of themselves you know um, you know you're, you, you are your children's you know most important most significant role models. And so, you know, are you, um, 
you know, exercising? Are you getting on the treadmill or getting out in, you know, natural light periodically or, you know, often? Um, are you eating healthy? Are you um, drinking too much or, you know, um, you know, keeping the news on 24 seven or binge watching Netflix? I think that it's, it's difficult to, you know, you know, ask your teen to go and take a walk um, if, you know, you're not modeling that um, kind of, you know, healthy behavior yourself, because, you know, what I often hear in my office is, you know, my, my, my mom tells me to go out and exercise, but, you know, you know, she's always, you know, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. And so, you know, I'm not sure why I have to go outside. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, you want to, you want to set the, the best example that you can. And, and also it's just important to take care of yourself, um, for sure. And, um, you know, uh, I would also say that, you know, it's important to, um, make sure that your teen is staying healthy and, um, that, you know, there are some important ways that you can, um, you know, connect with your teen around issues of mental health. Um, that, you know, one way I find um, really helpful is if you, instead of making, you know, sitting across the, the table from your teen and making eye contact and trying to talk about mental health, I find it really helpful to be actually next to your teenager, either on a walk or, um, you know, lying in bed, maybe, you know, at bedtime, um, if you can go and lie next to your teenager, if, you, if your teen will allow it and, you know, be in the dark and staring up at the ceiling or uh, go take a drive. I think this is really helpful for parents of teen boys. I hear a lot, um, you know, my, my son won't talk to me, but, you know, in, in a car, um, you'd be amazed at what might come up. And so, you know, you, you want to um, just, you know, take a drive and, and see what happens, take a walk, see what happens. And, and um, you know, just, just give your teen the space to talk to you um, without sort of the direct ask. That that's, that's I find, um, much less threatening to a teenager um, for sure. And, um, you know, you also, um, do you wanna sort of chime in on, you know, ways that that would be helpful as a teen? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I think that you touched on this a little bit about how indirect communication about mental health is sometimes, well, oftentimes the most effective, because I know that when I was first starting to talk about mental health with my mom, I was incredibly intimidated and just scared of the outcome of me coming forward that I was feeling symptoms of depression or I was struggling with my anxiety a lot lately. Because obviously as a kid, you don't wanna add all of that unnecessary stress to your parents because you know how much they care about you and you know how much they worry about a million things already. And so you don't wanna to add to that add to their plate. Um, and so what I did was I started writing letters, um, both by hand and just typing them up on Google Docs and then printing them out or just ripping them out of my journal and then sliding it under my mom's bedroom door just so she would be able to read it and comprehend what I'm telling her, but in a different location than I was in. So it was very indirect and a bit more complicated than just like going straight up to her and telling her what I was going through. Um, but it made it a lot easier because I didn't have to look her in the eye while I was doing it. I didn't have to analyze her, um, her physical reaction to it, whether she frowned at me or like furred her brow or something, because then all of a sudden I would overanalyze her reaction and say, and think, oh no, she's super stressed now, or oh no, she's going to invalidate my feelings and say that, you know what, just deal with it, blah, 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 and that I wouldn't hear the reaction that I wanted to. So I think that if you're a teen watching this right now, or even as a parent, you could try this, maybe try writing a letter and that can kind of be the way you start communicating about mental health with one another. And then what's helped me later on is when I come to my mom about something that I'm going through mentally, for example, if I've been feeling super stressed and anxious lately, and there isn't necessarily one um, 
one cause behind that anxiety and stress, then I usually tell her, is it okay if you just listen and I just need some comfort and support right now? I don't really need advice because I think that um, advice wise, I can get through this by myself. It's just, I need someone to listen and to acknowledge what I'm going through. And that's what I found not only with myself, but also with my peers as well. When I talk to them about, oh, how do you talk about mental health with your family? A lot of times, we just want to be validated and we just want to be heard because I think that a lot of parents jump to solutions right away and what they can do or what they would do if they were in, the, in their kid's position or, oh, they should do X and Y to solve this. But doing that diminishes the, the kid's feelings and it makes it feel, it makes them feel as if what they're going through is so easily resolved and it's really not that big of a deal and they should shouldn't be feeling sad or frustrated or angry or whatnot. And so then this whole invalidation thing happens and that causes the teen to not go to their parents anymore and turn to other people or not turn to anyone and just suppress their emotions, which in the long term definitely is detrimental to an individual's mental health because the longer we keep it all shut inside of ourselves, the longer our mental illnesses or mental health struggles will prolong. Um, so I definitely recommend for both teens and parents to try to communicate. It is difficult for sure, but I think that it's also super crucial to think about alternative ways that you can try that communication because I think that a lot of people try the same thing over and over and over. For example, some parents keep asking, oh, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you feeling? And then they keep finding that they get the same result, which is their teen saying, I'm fine, and then moving on. And so try different approaches. For example, what Dr. Sherwood said, maybe lie down next to them, go on a walk, do something that doesn't require direct eye contact. And I think that when you try different approaches, it also yields different results. And oftentimes, one of those situations will yield a positive result. So that's my recommendation to both teens and parents. Yeah, I would say on the heels of that, you know, there's sort of some don'ts as parents that, you know, we, you, it's very tempting because we love our kids, right? So we want to, you know, provide them with solutions or, you know, um, a, a lot of times I'll hear from teenagers, well, you know, when I open up to my mom or dad, then they want to just tell me, well, you know, that happened to me when I was 16 or, you know, here's how I solved it when I, you know, had an argument with my friend um, or, you know, something else that is, is very unhelpful is if you respond with, you know, if you're, if you're, teen is telling you, I'm sad, I'm stressed, um, you know, and, and as a parent, you say, well, what do you have to be sad about? Or, you know, you should just be happy. Um, that, that that totally dismisses your child's experience and, you know, kind of indicates you are not a safe person for um, your child to confide in. And so, you know, another piece of this is that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be you as the parent that, you know, you, you know, ideally have, you know, a, a trusted adult in your child, at least one in your child's life. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, part of the developmental task of adolescence is separation and individuation. And that essentially means preparing for leaving the nest. And so, you know, if your child really doesn't want to um, you know, share with you, that's, you know, don't take that personally, but you, you do, you know, is there, um, you know, a, a, uh, trusted teacher or, you know, uh, an aunt or a cousin or an older sibling or, you know, uh, someone that, you know, even a, a, um, religious professional, I mean, is there somebody that your child can confide in that, you know, you might reach out to and, you know, or you might let your ask your child, hey, have you talked to, you know, um, Mrs. Smith lately? Um, you know, just to kind of plant the seed um, that you encourage that sort of a relationship. That that doesn't take away from your own relationship with uh, your child. It, it just, you know, is it's just a way to support your child, um, you know, transitioning into adulthood. Yeah, exactly. And something I want to add to that is. 
if there's one thing that I want parents to recognize about teens and their mental health is that what we're going through is not just a phase, because I know that that's been used oftentimes when referring to what their teens are going through. If they're if they seem sluggish or lazy or constantly irritable, it doesn't mean that they're just going through a teen phase. It most likely indicates that they're going through a mental health struggle. And sometimes that can lead to depression or serious anxiety issues or other forms of mental illnesses. I know for me, I ended up having depression when my parents initially just thought that I was, you know, just going through that middle school phase. Um, and then I ended up having an eating disorder, even though my parents thought that I was initially just picky and all of these things. So you want to pay attention to the symptoms that your child is um, is having and try to brainstorm some sort of solution and also address what they're going through by having one of those mental health related conversations because I think that the longer you avoid having those really vulnerable transparent discussions um, the more likely your kids are to end up suffering immensely from a mental illness. So like I think Katie just said in the in the chat, well, being vulnerable is very difficult and intimidating and scary, but I think that in the long run, it helps everyone because the first time you have that vulnerable conversation is the first step to breaking down that barrier between the kid and the parent, so. And, you know, it is, you know, really important to, to be tuned in and especially, you know, you know, noticed is your child, is your child's appetite changing? Are, are his or her sleep habits different? You know, are, are, um, you know, is our schoolwork habits shifting? You know, are there, you know, is your child more isolated? And, you know, it is difficult to find a, you know, a, a mental health um, professional with openings. I mean, I, I, believe me, I mean, it, there are long waiting lists and, and, you know, I hear from a lot of frustrated people that it's just, it's hard to get a call back. Um, you know, if you can't find, and, and in this day and age right now in the pandemic, you know, most of us are doing teletherapy. Um, you know, there are some excellent uh, options through online, um, you know, better help is one of them, um, you know, where, where you can, you know, find someone for either yourself or your child, you know, who, who may be struggling particularly, um, you know, during this, this difficult time of, of the pandemic and, you know, the, the winter holiday season. And I, yeah, did you want to say? Go ahead. No, okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to say that, I don't know, I've, how many people are listening to this or what ages they are. Um, but for example, if you can relate, let me know in the chat. Um, but I'm, so I'm 17, as I said before, and I'm also, so our whole family immigrated from Russia and my parents grew up in the Soviet Union. Um, so <laughs> I think that indicates a lot about what they, how they approached mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we had a very deal with it, get over it type of, um, type of mentality for the majority of my and my sister's life. Um, and so that made it very difficult to acknowledge that we were going through mental health struggles. And I think that also as a kid, I had to mature very quickly because I realized that my parents didn't quite understand mental health as well as my generation did. And although it's not the responsibility of the kid to take care of their parents, obviously it's usually, well, obviously it's the, it's the other way around. But sometimes you do have to assume that role of not necessarily a caregiver, but I think that you should be aware of your parents' background, how, how they grew up, um, how they view mental health. And it's not their fault that they don't have perhaps have the same empathy or they don't have the same understanding of mental illnesses because they simply grew up in a different way, just like you're going to grow up in a different way from your kids, you know? And so I think that what I started to do is also acknowledge that my parents are just people with different experiences and different perspectives. And for example, during COVID-19, um, and as I just get older too, I recognize that parents also go through ups and downs, who knew? <laughs> um, but they're not, all, they can't always be 100% parents and 100% at their best at all times. And so for example, if I see that my mom might be feeling very exhausted for several days at a time, or maybe she, I can tell she's super stressed and perhaps she's not 
doing her outdoor walks or doing her workout videos or reading and spending excessive time on the internet and stuff. I try to get her back into that groove of healthy habits by asking, hey, do you want to do a workout with me or do you just want to go on a walk or go out with me and grab some food or something? And so I think that especially as you get older, for example, like I'm turning 18 soon, I'm going to be an adult soon. I think it's also important to treat your parents as just human beings rather than just parents who are supposed to know everything and have everything at the top of their game all the time. Um, so yeah, if you're a teen out here listening, maybe try and offer to do something with your parents because one, I'm sure it'll make their day and two, it could even help them get out of a funk. So yeah, I think that it's really important to especially during COVID-19, to treat your family as a team that functions at its best when all of the team members are supporting each other and checking in with one another. Um, yeah. And your parents are very lucky to have you, Anastasia, truly. Um, I think you're awesome. And, uh, and um, I just wanted to, to jump on that and sort of offer some ways besides taking walks um, and you know, um, you know, going for drives, I wanted to kind of offer some, some ways that you could perhaps, you know, um, join together and, um, you know, kind of keep each other healthy. Um, there's, you know, exercise, I, again, the choices are kind of limited right now. It is cold outside, but, you know, it's okay to walk in the cold, um, just bundle up and, you know, um, there are also many, many YouTube, you know, um, yoga and, and all sorts of fitness programs that are available online if you are interested in, you know, maybe even trying something new, a Pilates class or something, um, you know, just, just do a Google search and you'll be able to find it. Uh, jigsaw puzzles, board games, uh, baking, cooking. Uh, creating a vision board, you know, I, of, you know, what, what, what you're hoping for in, in 2021, because, you know, 2020 doesn't seem to be able to be over fast enough. Um, you know, that, that there are many ways to connect with your um, family members. And, you know, I, I want uh, Anastasia to get a chance to share what something that she's been doing um, this year. But I also want to say that, you know, it's not all about being together, that it's also really appropriate to set boundaries and um, to be able to ask for space when you need it. And you know, that, that um, I'm also a mom of teenagers and you know, I, I, it's important when you know, my teenager says, I, I need some quiet time that I respect that. And um, that you know, it's, it's okay to say, you know, um, you know, no mom and dad or grandma or, you know, whomever, um, I, I need to, you know, take five right now or, you know, friends who are get, getting together and there are lots of people who are getting together and uh, hanging out, you know, it's, it's okay to say, you know, no, um, that, that you have to really focus on, um, you know, what's best for your physical and mental health, that that's really the most important, I would say, kind of mantra um, through the, this next period of time, which is, you know, going to be probably the most challenging because we are, you know, heading into winter. And, um, and so, you know, you want to really be clear on, you know, what's best for, for um, my health, my family member's health, and um, that includes physical and mental health. And I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, and something that has helped me personally a lot during this time of isolation is practicing mindfulness and gratitude on a daily basis. And I think that a lot of people have a very skewed version no skewed vision of what um, mindfulness is. I think that a lot of people immediately associate it with just meditation and just sitting there and going um, um for, yeah for um, an hour or so. But that's not at all what it is. Mindfulness is simply just bringing yourself back to the present moment um, and just reminding yourself that everything in this present moment is 
totally okay. And my anxiety is mostly about the, the past or the future, but right in this very moment, in this second, there aren't many things that are really bothering me. And so something that I do to bring myself back to the present moment is I journal every single day, which I know <laughs> can seem a little bit much for some people, especially if you've never journaled before. So maybe just start off journaling once a week or something. And it doesn't have to be anything super fancy, like a fancy prompt or anything. It can simply be about three things that you're grateful for or 10 things or 50, you know, however much paper space you have. Um, and something else that I do to practice gratitude is I actually have it right here on my desk. It's a little jar <laughs> with um, a bunch of sheets of paper in it. And basically I started doing this since uh, January of this year. And I just started writing um, on these little she sheets of paper, little moments that I just really was grateful for in that moment. And so I would write it down and then I'd put it in the jar. And at the end of 2020, I'm gonna have a bunch of really cool memories to look back on that honestly, I've been surprised by some of the stuff that's in here. So clearly I wouldn't have remembered it all if it weren't in this jar. Um, and something else that I do is I love going on runs. Um, I personally love exercise. And for me, exercise isn't so much about the physical results. Um, it's mostly about how it improves my mental health because I immediately feel so much more clear headed. Um, I have less anxiety and I just feel happier and more motivated and energetic after I go on a run or I do some sort of exercise. So I try to implement running. Now that I look at it, uh, yeah, I do it basically every single day, which I know again is a lot, but you don't have to do it every single day is what I'm saying. Just do what makes you, your mind feel good and what makes you feel energetic and a little bit happier than you were feeling the moment before. And I think that Again, I don't want to put pressure on you to exercise every single day, practice gratitude every single day. I'm just telling you these things that have worked for me personally and that I was able to fit into my schedule. So find something that works for you um, and implement that into your schedule. And if you want any other unique ideas, we are going to be sending out a little toolkit at the end of this presentation. I believe it's going to be emailed to you tomorrow morning, tomorrow. which is a bunch of... Uh, it's just basically a slideshow uh, comprised of different slides with activities and just everything that we covered uh, during this presentation. So you have a toolkit to refer back to in case you wanna implement any of those things into your routine. Um, so yeah, I think we, we're gonna end this discussion off with setting boundaries and why that's important and how you can set boundaries. So Dr. Sherwood, do you wanna talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, I did. I, I touched on that a little bit before um, you um, shared with us the, the excellent ways you've been taking care of yourself. Um, but, you know, no is a complete sentence. And so, you know, it, you don't really need to give a reason um, if you're not able to, you know, um, you know, go to, you know, an extended family's, um, you know, large Christmas dinner. Um, if that is not going to work for you and and your um, your individual family and yourself, um, that 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 it's okay to you know wait until next year or when you know there is a, a, things are safer in the world to you know be in large groups and um, you know like I was saying earlier, I mean it's it's okay to say no to friends who you know as you know college kids are home and you know that that. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a tricky balance, you know, because we have to give our, we have to respect that our college kids are, you know, adults, uh, technically, and that, you know, they're going to make choices that we might not always agree with um, when it comes to socializing. But, you know, you don't have to feel, you know, it, if you are a college student um, listening, you don't, you don't have to feel like you have to participate that, again, you know, better to be safe now so that you have, you know, your health and you have the, um, you know, opportunities down the road. There's, there's plenty of time ahead of us um, when we'll be able to be with family and friends um, that, you know, we all um, are, are missing um, for sure during this time. Yes, thank you for that. And I apologize, I know we went a little bit over time, but it's the end of the discussion. Um, and so we're gonna end off with just one little interactive activity again with your pen and paper. If you all could just write down one or two things that you are planning on implementing into your daily routine um, that demonstrates self-care. Um, and while you're doing that, I guess we'll open it up to the, to a Q, to the Q and A session, right?
All right, that was wonderful, you guys. Thank you so much for all that insight. Uh, such important information. Um, I really appreciate your um, talk just at the end there, Haley, about the boundaries. And, you know, um, I just think about how that's going to look different for each person, right? I mean, you yes. have to decide um, what works for you and um, somebody else may have a completely different set of rules and maybe even within your own family that may uh, vary. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, but you got, I, I do appreciate that, you know, we, we all need to identify and know what we feel most comfortable with, you know, that we're not going to have too many regrets or anxiety about later and, mm -hmm. um, and move from that and then not apologize. I love your sentence. No is a complete sentence. That is, I never thought of that, <laughs> but that's such good information. Yeah. So. You don't have to give a reason. Yeah. So we do have a question from the audience and I have a question, um, but if you do have a question that came to you while Haley and Dr. Sherwood and Anastasia were talking, please do use the Q&A box down in the bottom of you. If you just hover your, um, your mouse over your, the bottom of the screen, you'll see Q&A pop up and you can stick a question in there and we'll be sure to address it tonight. The first one we do have, it's a, it's a serious one, but I think it's it's an important one to talk about is um, what is the best way to support your team with mental health struggles when you yourself are struggling? Mm. So I, that seems like a Dr. Sherwood one for us. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, um, that, that is a, 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 an excellent uh, question. Um, and, and, you know, I think First and foremost, you know, it's it's kind of uh, it reminds me of you know what they tell us when we get on the airplanes, um, which I know many of us are not doing right now. But you know, you put your oxygen mask on first, right, and then you help your child. Um, that you know, if you as mom, dad, grandma, guardian, whomever, um, are having a hard time, you know, please get yourself some help, and and you know. Re I, I really mean that, you know, if you can't find someone through your insurance or through the referral, um, you know, ask your primary care doctor, ask your OBGYN, um, ask your neurologist. I mean that, you know, um, many physicians know psychologists and, and social workers and, you know, therapists and can refer. Um, and if, if you can't find somebody, uh, you can look online that, that I believe there's actually a list on the This Is My Brave um, webpage of some of the online um, resources. And many people, I mean, I, I'm, you know, a big fan of podcasts and, you know, the, you, right now, um, one that I'm listening to, you know, they, they advertise for um, better help. And they themselves talk about, you know, going to better help. Oh, it's thisismybrave.org resources. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Um, and, um, you know, get yourself to, you know, steady your ground and, you know, at the same time, um, do the same for your, for your kiddo. Um, and, you know, really there, there is, you know, all that we're talking about, anxiety, depression, seasonal affective disorder, um, dread, loneliness, loss, uh, grief, you know, that, that having somebody outside of your family to talk to that's subjective um, is it's just as important as if you had diabetes or migraines or cancer or, you know, any physical um, issue that, you know, these, these mental health issues are just as important and, you know, they need attention to um, from a professional. I, we did put over in the chat earlier, so scroll through that chat. Katie found the link because actually this is my brave um, earlier in the year partnered with BetterHelp. And um, so we have a, a link that we've shared there in the chat um, that will offer you an opportunity to get matched with the therapist and do a month of therapy for free online with betterhelp.com. So look through the chat there because um, there is a good link if you want to give that a try. So just like um, Dr. Sherwood said, many people report really great um, experiences with that. 
And, um, you know, even therapists right now are online anyway, right? <laughs> you know? They are, yes. <laughs> right. So, All day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Anastasia, I know you talked about um, finding ways to um, kind of make inroads with your mom when you wanted to talk to her about mental health and um, you were sliding notes under the door, which I think is great. And that generated some chatter over here in the chat box. But um, now it sounds like you guys are maybe uh, in a, a little bit more comfortable place about having those conversations. So how do those, uh, how do those conversations start now? I mean, who, who initiates and, and like, is there a, like a key phrase that you use where it gives everybody a heads up? Oh, this is one of those conversations. Well, <laughs> so right now, I think it's definitely more of me trying to talk to my mom more so then she is trying to talk to me because I have a feeling that she might be sick of me at this point because um, I've just grown to so, to so attached to her during uh, the pandemic. I'm just constantly like wanting to give her a hug or, or talk to her. And she's always just like, like, leave me alone for now. Okay, just give me a little bit of alone time. But um, honestly, I even, I, I mentioned this to her today before I ended up doing this uh, webinar. I was telling her I'm, I'm not feeling that good. And I feel like I need to talk after, after I, you know, finish my job right here <laughs> um, because I was feeling very anxious today and just a little bit uncertain about the future. And so I think that over the past few months, every single time that I bring up the fact that I just want to talk, um, that kind of indicates that I'm probably going to be talking about my, my mental health, perhaps my anxiety, um, something that has been giving me a little bit of stress um, or just worry. And so I think that those phrases develop over time and they're just patterns that your parents are going to or that the parents are going to start picking up on because I think that mine is very specific to me it might be very different for someone else but I think that also I I don't know if this is just a reflex of mine but for some reason whenever I talk to my mom about mental health my go-to way of approaching that conversation is very jokey casual it's not it's never super serious like I need to talk to you about this this is super serious I'm going through the through x y and z please help me whatever it's always like <laughs> this is gonna sound so like silly but I'm I literally tell her I'm like I'm feeling floopy and floopy such it's not even a word I don't think but it's it's just I made it up because I feel like it just it, it kind of explains how I'm feeling, what I'm going through, but it doesn't make the topic of mental health so serious because I mm -hmm. think that part of the reason mental health has the stigma around it is because it's treated as a very serious, dense, dark subject when in reality, it doesn't have to be. It's the same thing as mm -hmm. physical health. It's like telling your mom, I have a bruise, I need ice or something, you know, like sometimes you just have a mental bruise and you need some ice, <laughs> and which, and that ice could be just a hug or just her presence, like literally a few weeks ago. Now that I'm looking back at it, like I have such weird ways of dealing <laughs> with my mental health sometimes. Um, but like a few weeks ago, I was feeling, oh, this was before one of my college decisions came out and I was feeling super anxious and stressed I mean obviously and I had told her three times already that day that I was feeling this way and so at that point she didn't even know what to do she just like gave me a hug but I was still feeling um, that anxiety so I asked if I could just lay down by her desk while she was doing work because I still wanted to feel her presence and just that comfort because even without talking to each other I still felt her support um, in that way, I just felt her energy. And so that helped. I laid there for <laughs> like five minutes and then I felt so much better. I went back to my room and proceeded with my day. So sometimes you just need to find little things like that. And I think that it helps a lot when you make the topic of mental health less serious. And when you don't, when you, this is what Dr. Sherwood said before, instead of asking, oh, how are you feeling? What emotions are you know going through you right now? Instead be like, on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? Or if you could describe your day in one word, how would you describe it? Things like that just make it less intimidating for teens to come forward about their mental health. Um, so yeah, that's that's my advice. Great. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come. Oh, here we go. Um, 
Thanks, Jada. Um, how would you suggest getting school staff to listen and take mental health seriously? Which is interesting and in question in, in regular times, but um, now, you know, it's it maybe even harder to get the attention of folks um, at, in a school environment. I don't know. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to cast aspersions, but what do you say, Dr. Sherwood? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's um, it's certainly possible. I mean, um, I, I, I'm guessing, you, I'm just sort of speak broadly um, from, you know, teachers to administrators. So I, I think that more and more, I mean, I, I can speak to like Fairfax County and, and um, Loudoun County in, in Northern Virginia. I think more and more teachers are, are opening up about, you know, how much they care about mental health. Um, I know one of my daughter's teachers is like super into um, mental health and he takes mental health days from teaching off of teaching. And so you know, if there is, um, you know, a way to communicate, if there's a teacher that you trust, I would say maybe start there um, and, you know, have a, an offline conversation. I mean, teachers are accessible even during this, you know, time of online learning, um, you know, that, that if there's a, a learning issue that's being impacted by something going on emotionally, I would say that that's certainly a time to, you know, um, enlist the help of a professional because, you know, there are, um, let's say if, you know, you're, you're distracted or you're, you know, um, you know, unmotivated or, you know, just, just going through a really rough period and, you know, maybe you need some extended time on assignments or, um, you, uh, you know, that that's a good one. Like you might need a, you know, a, a later deadline. You know, I, I think that that school personnel are more and more um, kind of in the loop here in, in mental health. I mean, I know that you know, we we do have a ways to go in, in terms of you know uh, the stigma of all of it, and I feel like that's part of why you know this is my brave and organizations like it are are so important. Um, but, you know, I, I'm get, I can see part of a chat. Mental health seems to be a, I, I miss, I, I only got a little bit of it. Yeah, it seems um, to be a more normalized topic, but within schools at the same time, it's almost too normalized, she said, because th they seem to be attributing everything to being caused by the pandemic. So maybe mm -hmm. over generalizing or oversimplifying or maybe not paying attention really when somebody's saying I'm struggling to get to the root of it. Maybe just you know, glossing over and saying, well, you know, everybody is with the pandemic, right? Right. And, you know, it's that that's true. I mean, everybody is struggling in some way um, in, in, during the pandemic. And so I think that that, you know, everybody deserves for that to be taken seriously. If you need a day off or you need to you know, turn something in late. I mean, I think that there needs to be um, room for that. And, you know, again, I would start with a trusted teacher um, that you could confide in and, you know. I'd like to pitch in on this. Yeah. I've had experience with sure. um, teachers who I had to email because I just wasn't going through a good time, like specifically during the pandemic. For example, a few weeks ago, I ended up sleeping in through my entire mm -hmm. first period, which was completely unintentional, but it just mm -hmm. happened. And to be honest, I don't regret it. Now I'm not promoting <laughs> like skipping class or anything. However, I, I woke up, I had a beautiful nine hours sleep <laughs> and I realized that I had missed my class. So of course, as any responsible student who misses their class, I emailed my teacher and I told her at first I was going to make up an excuse and say, oh, a doctor's appointment that I forgot to tell you about or something. But then I realized this is doing that would be prolonging the stigma around mental health. Because if I didn't, 
if I chose to not say that, oh, I had to sleep in because I couldn't go, I couldn't fall asleep until a really late time because of my anxiety. If I didn't say that, then I would have just been avoiding the topic of mental health and just continuing this whole stigma surrounding it and not making people, especially teachers, realize that it's an actual issue. So what I did was I told her exactly what I said before is that I went to sleep really late because of my anxiety and it was keeping me awake and I couldn't fall asleep until after like several hours past midnight. And so I really needed that sleep. And she responded, she was super understanding. And she said that it's, oh, it's totally okay if you need time for yourself. I get it. You take rigorous classes. You have a huge workload. We're in a pandemic. All of these things are obviously affecting your mental health. So I think it's super important to be 100% transparent because I think that even when people, for example, I mean, specifically teens, when they say, oh, but I have tried that. I have tried talking to my teacher. Ask yourself, have you really? Because a lot of times people tiptoe around the topic of mental health, but they never straight up say, I had a bunch of anxiety last night, so I literally could not sleep. And that's why I'm late to your class. Like many people are not straight up about that. And that's what makes, that's what minimizes the issue of mental health and mental illness and stuff. And so you need to be super transparent and also proactive about reaching out to teachers if you are struggling, because at the end of the day, taking a break is going to benefit you much more in the long run if you just keep suppressing your emotions and pushing through and pushing through assignments. Because honestly, sometimes a couple assignments are they're not even worth anything if you have to sacrifice your mental health. They're really not. Um, and that's coming from a girl who's like, who used to be a perfectionist and I needed straight A's and stuff. So if I can learn to accept that, you definitely can too. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's all about reaching out to teachers. And while well, yes, I saw the comment from Jada, it says that mental health is becoming a normalized topic, but again, everyone's just attributing it to the pandemic. So it's not really that big of a deal. And as much as that sucks, and I wish it wasn't this way, I also think that we are making huge strides towards eliminating the stigma surrounding mental health. And we can't expect schools to all of a sudden care and go from zero to a hundred and just accommodate their students with all of these resources within like a year. And so they are making progress. And I think that especially right now, we should focus on the present moment and what solutions we can create right now, instead of focusing on, oh, well, what will the mental health resources look like after the pandemic? Because not in all honesty, we don't know when this is gonna end and stuff. And so the whole point is figuring out how to manage our mental health right now. And so for that, I would say, just contact your teachers and be 100% transparent. And this is my brave is actually, uh, there, there was a plan to you know be um, at least in, in Fairfax County schools, um, you know, and, and to hold auditions for kids from, you know, all the local high schools to come and, and share their stories. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So, you know, I, I think that that's down the pike um, once we're on the other side of this, that, you know, this is my brave is doing, you know, what it can to, um, you know, um, to, you know, make mental health, um, you know, better understood. Uh, in the education system. Yeah, I think thankfully the one shining spot of the pandemic is it is becoming a more normalized topic and people are making it, uh, making mental health a, a priority. Mm -hmm. And those conversations are happening a little bit more frequently than, um, than they once were. And so sure. hopefully, yes, I think you're right, Anastasia, we have some still strides, strides to make, um, but we're taking, you, you know, the longest journey starts with one step, also a nice quote, right? So we're, we've taken some steps, maybe more than one at this point. So, um, well, we took us some steps tonight and um, I really am grateful to our panelists this evening um, and for everybody who managed to get through to join us. And I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but as Anastasia mentioned before, we will um, have a toolkit for everybody who is registered and that'll be sent out tomorrow morning. Um, it'll include some slides that also have some resources that can help you make mental health a priority this holiday season that can help you help your kids make it a priority. Um, so thank you everyone for being here with us. And um, 
hopefully we can do this again. Anastasia loves doing this, right? <laughs> and she has such great insight. So thank you so much for sharing that and for your enthusiasm, yes. bringing this message to all of us. We really appreciate it. And your professional insight, Dr. Sherwood, was really, really helpful. So uh, we thank all of you for your time tonight and we wish you the best uh, this holiday season. I hope you all find a way to uh, find nuggets of joy, um, even despite some of the challenges that we're facing. And so, um, to all a good night, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.